Hey, good day, everyone. Welcome to Aerospace Live. My name is Bob Roberts, and we have on a pilot today that does an incredibly gorgeous flight almost every day of his life in the picturesque country of Papua New Guinea as a missionary pilot. Now, less than a year ago, he decided to share those flights and started the Missionary Pilot YouTube channel. He even goes as far as sharing the flight plans and weather for the flights so that you can replicate the flights with your own flight simulator. Now, I will have links to all of Ryan's YouTube channel and his Patreon channel if you want to help support Ryan and you also to gain some additional content. Uh, I'm gonna put all of that into the show notes down below. So I guess without wasting any more time, let's go ahead and welcome the missionary pilot himself, Ryan Barron. Hey Ryan, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks for having me on, appreciate it. Well, I'm glad to have you on. Now, Ryan, a lot of folks, um, you know, they don't hear a, a big accent, right? Uh, so you actually, you grew up, um, in, you were, spent a couple of years in Papua New Guinea, but then you also came to the U.S. Um, and actually, we, you were a member of Civil Air Patrol for a little bit. Where, what was your squadron? Actually, I wasn't part of it. I looked into it um, back uh, 2010, 11, or something like that. And at that time, it was just I didn't ha I couldn't I didn't have the time to be able to okay. get what they wanted in time. But uh, it looks like a really cool thing, though. Okay, great. Um, now, where 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 did you live in the United States? Um, I grew up in Michigan. I'm from the states, but we lived over here um, in elementary school. My parents were missionaries. Over over here for four years and then pretty much from seventh grade until about 25 years old i lived in jackson michigan okay all right so it's not so to say it lightly it is a lot warmer where you live now um it's actually perfect so pretty much every day because we're so close to the equator the the weather doesn't change that much as far as temperature goes so in the morning it's usually um kind of like the mid 60s and in the afternoon it's kind of in the low 80s so it's pretty much perfect temperature all year round Wow. Okay. So that's almost like Hawaii. It's like, it's like the, the down South version of Hawaii. Now for the folks, the folks that don't know, um, where Papua New Guinea is, where is Papua New Guinea? It's right above Australia. It's an island that split half of its Indonesia and half of its Papua New Guinea. Okay, cool. How did you end up flying in Papua New Guinea? Um, I, like I said, I lived here as a kid for a few years in elementary school. So this is something that I kind of through high school decided that this is what I wanted to do and went through Ethnos 360's uh, mission like training and then went through their um, flight training as well for nine months. And that's how I got the job here is I work with a mission organization. That's great, that's, that's incredible. So, so, so you knew from an early age then that, that this was the direction you wanted to go in. So, so how, did, did you always know you wanted to fly? Um, no? At least being a pilot, for sure. What got yeah, you from into from the like missionary world? First grade on is kind of when I wanted. Oh, I'm sorry, say again. It was kind of breaking up. Yeah, no worries. And just for the folks listening, um, we are literally on the other side of the world from Ryan. So there is a little, you're probably going to hear a little bit of delay. And Ryan and I may step on each other once in a while. We're waiting for uh, you know, all the telecommunications equipment to get our, our sound to each other. Um, so what, what I was saying was, uh, what got you interested in aviation to begin with? Um, I think just flying in general, it was always very, very interesting to me. Um, I did a couple of small flights when I was like first grade out to some bush locations for like Christmas vacation and whatnot. And I think those just stuck with me. So right all the way up through high school, I think probably around 10th or 11th grade was kind of when I was thinking, I think I want to become a pilot like for sure. And that's the direction I'm going to go once I get out of high school. And I think I'd like to do missions just because I grew up around missions and I saw that there was a huge need for missions. And not many people were that interested in helping out or going into it. But I think growing up in it, um, I saw from a different perspective going, yeah, it's just like any other job. If someone wants to become an airline pilot, well, this is just another career choice is just becoming a missionary pilot. Now, now, where did you end up getting your initial uh, flight training? You did that in the States, right? Yeah, my initial private certificate was done in Jackson, Michigan at a community college uh, uh, that was right out of high school when I was 19. I flew for like a year, year and a half, and maybe got like 90 hours as all. Well. And to be honest, it was super boring. It was like without any purpose behind it. It was just it was just going and flying for, for nothing. And it was, I don't know, it just got really boring after about a year. Or so I was like, well, I don't know if I actually want to do this. And I actually stopped flying for five or six years and then picked it up. Yeah, like five or six years later when I was like 26 or something after I realized, okay, I've kind of 
looked into all these other avenues on what I might want to do, but nothing's really quite fitting, fitting the hole. So uh, went back into aviation after that. Now, now, how did you move from aviation into, now you, you had mentioned it already that um, you had seen kind of the desire when you were younger with the missionary pilots. So um, I gotta be honest. So when, when I first, when I hear of a missionary pilot, so for those of you, those are the folks listening that haven't seen your videos yet. Um, you know, people that land these airplanes, you know, in the mountains, you know, on these upslope uh, runways, um, you know, basically on grass that you're hoping somebody cut the grass, you know, <laughs> at some point in the last week. Uh, so you don't get too much uh, friction on the wheels. Um, you know, I, I envision like these crazy people, right? I don't envision clean cut professional Ryan, right? I, I, I envision some <laughs> lunatic, um, you know, that, <laughs> that was probably drinking too much the night before and, uh, you know, and really wants to live on the edge. Yeah. Um, but yet, yet I see you and, you know, you're, you're about as professional as, as, as you can look. Um, I mean, are you the norm or is everybody else just crazy? And you're, you're the, you're the exception. I would say I'm the norm in the realm of our mission organization and then like MAF and JARS. I would say we all have the same standards for what we want to do as far as professionalism and safety wise. But I have heard stories from some of our missionaries about other operators here in Papua New Guinea that make them extremely nervous when they come. And when, you know, people from their village will get on these planes, like they're just freaking out for them going, oh man, I hope they come back alive. So yeah, there are <laughs> definitely those pilots out in here in Papua New Guinea. Um, but to be honest, I haven't heard great stories about them and, and had heard bad stories about wrecks and things as well. So they definitely do exist here in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Cause you guys are flying for the most part, single engine aircraft and there's not, I mean, it's, it's basically for anybody that know you know, doesn't know Papua New Guinea is basically a big mountain range. Right. And so, so, um, you know, yeah, with just much, yes. nonstop trees everywhere and, and you'll, you'll find a couple of areas that they chop the trees down so that you can land. Um, so, yeah. so I just, I just have this envisionment of these crazy people, you know, I, I, now it's funny, right? You talk about the, the, the passengers and I can just see it also because you're in the mountains, I can just see the turbulence being really crazy probably at sometimes. Right. Yeah, it is. There's certain areas. Um, it's not turbulent everywhere because, because we're so, close to the equator the winds are not really strong like they are in the states like i okay. spend a lot of time in the midwest and we don't have those type of winds but there are certain certain areas and certain times of the day that certain specific areas are always always turbulent and you just kind of expect that and kind of brief all your passengers hey the last 10 minutes of the flight it's gonna be really bumpy so get your sick bag out before you need it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i'm envisioning this crazy the crazy pilot you know, going, you know, looking back at all the passengers already scared and going, hang on, we're going in. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> now, now because of, um, one thing I thought was interesting was you, you do go obviously in some really remote places, right? And so, and a lot of the people that you really service are pretty low income communities, at least what we would, you know, think of in the United States anyways, as being low income. Yeah. So how, how are those, well, I got a couple questions about that, but how are the flights paid for? Like how, like how, I mean, those people I can't imagine can afford, you know, a $500 airplane ticket. Yeah. So, um, I would say most of my flights, probably I'm guessing in the 90 to 95% of my flights are for specific missionaries. So usually I'm filming on one of my back flights or if I have an empty flight out there to pick them up. So they're paying for the flight. Um, they don't pay like we subsidize it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say the flight is maybe a thousand dollars as actual cost or something. And they fly their family out. I think their minimum that they're going to have to pay out of that is probably maybe like six or $700, okay. um, depending on how much weight they fly. So we charge by weight. And then as far as the communities that we fly for, we do fly for those as well, but we usually do a charter. So like I, I flew a couple of charters actually for the government flying medicine and stuff out. So they'll just pay outright for the charter. And then some locals also have some stores out in these locations. So they'll just charter the plane. And there are people that have some a decent amount of money, but it's very few and far between because I would say 98% of the population in those bush locations, 
they still live in grass houses with grass roofs and their income is maybe if they can sell coffee or mm -hmm. cacao or something like that. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Now they, um, and so first of all, does that really give you, cause like anybody, you know, not anybody, you know, but being a pilot is a very special thing, right? But you're not an airline pilot, right? So, you know, you're not doing yeah. that normal, that normal airline gig, you know, every day. You're really, you're really hands-on, you know, with the people that you're flying with. Um, and, and I, I saw a couple of your videos where you had people that were sick, that were getting moved to a hospital. Um, you know, so you're, you're kind of doing a really interesting job. It's a super important job. It's directly affecting these people's lives. Um, do you get that sense of accomplishment doing that? Yeah, very much so. I really enjoyed it. It gives me a sense of purpose for sure. Um, if you just go across the internet, it seems like these days, so many people don't have a sense of purpose and they're just kind of floundering about looking for something that's going to fulfill whatever it is that they want to be fulfilled. So I really do enjoy that aspect about it. I really, really enjoy the aspect that we are helping people every day. I think medevac flights are my absolute favorite just because it's the spontaneousness of it and the fact that you're being able to help someone that potentially will save their life, which is, yeah, it's very rewarding. So I really like that. It is a different type of work um, than an airline pilot. I haven't done airline stuff, but I can imagine it would become pretty monotonous, um, especially doing just the same flights. And even though we're doing a lot of the same flights, I think we have maybe 50 or 55 locations, I think, that we fly to on average. Every single flight's completely different because the weather's different. So your route to get where you want to go every time is a hundred percent different unless it's, you know, during the summer months and it's nice out, but yeah, keeps you on your toes at all, all times. And it's, it's exhausting at times too, just dealing with another culture that most people don't really think about. So. Now Papua New Guinea, uh, cause it's close to Australia. Do they speak English or is it a different language? Uh, there's actually 800 different actual oh. languages in <laughs> Papua New Guinea. But they have a trade language. Um, this is just talk play or just talk pigeon, and it takes on average for most people four to six months to get to like a fluency, not like fluent, but like a capable level where you can have a conversation mm -hmm. on, you know, like a a four or five year old level kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the actual official language in PNG is English, but but. And most people can't speak English fluently. Gotcha. Gotcha. But now air traffic control, this for, for people that, that don't know, air traffic controllers throughout the whole world, the, you know, the, uh, the, the language is English for air traffic control. Right. So, um, and, yes. and have you had it now? One thing I thought was interesting, um, was we are so used to in the States having, unless you're like far West, like in the desert areas, Arizona, something like that. But for the most part, We've got great radar coverage, you know, we've got great navigational coverage, we've got great communications coverage with ATC. Um, it's, I mean, sometimes you, it seems like you have to struggle even with high frequency to be able to talk to air traffic control sometimes. Yeah, so yeah, we have uh, VHF and then HF. So VHF is um, what we try to get to first because it's usually the clearest. And then our HF is kind of have like our backup and we have basically about eight different channels that we can try them on. And some days you can't get them at all, no matter what. And you just do your flights. And then at the end of the day, you might get a hold of them and then give them all your details of where you went and when you landed <laughs> and stuff. But it can get pretty frustrating at times for sure. So you're just kind of communicating in the blind sometimes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you just, yeah, like I said, you just can't even get a hold of anybody and you just kind of, all right, well, I've spent my due diligence. I'm just going to go fly now and not worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Somebody might've heard me. Somebody might not have heard me, but I tried my best. You know, it'll be interesting um, yeah. long-term. I don't know if you follow us at all, but um, with uh, Elon Musk, with that whole Starlink satellite internet thing, it'll be really interesting yeah. in areas like Papua New Guinea um, where you have that hard time communicating. Like we have satellite today, but the latency is really bad because the satellites are so high. But with Starlink, it's going to be so low. It'll be interesting to see if VHF and HF end up becoming like a backup system and you end up having really good communications no matter where you are. So, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the future. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that'd that be respect. nice.
from a safety standpoint too, I would imagine. Cause if you ever had a problem with the airplane and you had to put it down someplace, you know, it might be a while before somebody knew you were missing. Well, thankfully we have a system in our airplanes called a V2 tracker. Okay. Uh, it's a company out of New Zealand and basically it's a, it uses either a GPS signal or a cell, a cell coverage service to where it follows us along on our home base computer. We can actually use our iPads and text back. And then if we were to have an emergency, we can just hit an emergency button. Oh, cool. And so at all times they know where we are, our altitude, our speed and things like that. And we can communicate back and forth. So having that we didn't have that five years ago but having it now really really makes it nice okay that, that's awesome yeah i could imagine like you said before you before people had that that had to have increased the risk quite a bit um so now you know when you when you started flying in the mountains um did you just kind of get thrown into it or did you have to go for a special training for the mountain flying yeah so um when i first got here I, we arrived at the end of 2014 and at the time, our mission organization didn't have, they were transitioning from the Cessna to a sixes, a small plane to the Kodiaks. So we didn't have any check-in training pilots at the time uh, for the Kodiak. So MAF actually, another organization, Mission Aviation Fellowship, they were low on pilots at the time, but they had check-in training pilots. So I actually went on loan with them. They trained me in their planes and I flew with them for a year. Oh, cool. until we got our Kodiaks and our check-in training pilots. And then I came back to Ethnos 360 and started flying. So I actually started in a piston engine, an air van mm -hmm. with MAF. They did all of my training and signed me off. And then I started flying solo in that for a few months. So the transition was a lot quicker into the Kodiak for myself. Now, the, um, now the Kodiak, for the folks that don't know... I mean, when I first see, when I first saw the aircraft, um, cause I'm not, it's not usually a type of flying I do. So I didn't, um, I didn't recognize it as a, as a Kodiak, as a Quest Kodiak at first. I thought it was a, I thought it was a Cessna Caravan. Um, so, I mean, are they, as a Cessna Caravan and the, the Quest Kodiak, are they fairly comparable as far as capabilities? As far as I know, I'm actually planning on doing a video with MAF and try to compare the differences exactly. Mm -hmm. but. I think for the most part, they carry about the same. Uh, for the first few years of the Kodiak, we actually had like um, an empty empty weight restriction. Like we can only put so like 800 some kgs into the cabin. Mm -hmm. And then just, I think like a year and a half ago, they, re they got rid of that um, restriction. So now if we take all of our seats out, we can carry a little over a thousand kgs. Yeah. Or I think the caravan is closer to 1100 kgs. But it's also, I think, about four feet longer of a cabin and right. maybe like eight inches to a foot wider as well. But it looks like whoever designed the Kodiak kind of had tracing paper pretty close <laughs> by to design their airplane. Okay, yeah. I mean, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, look at that. He's flying a, a, you know, a Cessna caravan. So, so they, um, okay, that's interesting. So the Kodiak is just a little tiny bit smaller, um, which frankly, for where you're yeah. flying might be a good thing um so that might yeah it's a tiny bit smaller it also has a bigger engine it has more horsepower and it has a four-bladed prop as opposed to a three-bladed prop okay so i think our takeoff performance is a little bit better so that which is really needed especially since you might be you know taking off on some wet tall grass so now when you yeah. have now when you have um because you're flying in so many places that are remote is there somebody before you fly to that airport for that day or in the next couple of days that goes and checks out the airport, the, 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 the landing strip, or is that kind of like you do a, a flight or, you know, you do an overflight to just uh, see it yourself? Uh, it depends. If we have missionaries out there, a lot of times we're able to communicate with them. They'll either have like satellite internet or we can text them with WhatsApp or something. Some places, and in fact, a lot of places actually have cell phone coverage um, in Papua New Guinea, even way out in the mountains, they'll throw out like a little solar panel, you know, digi cell thing. And we can at least get a hold of them most of the time. But again, the culture is different here. So they're going to tell you what you they think you want to hear. So they're going to tell you, oh, yeah, oh, it's yeah. <laughs> not every place. But some places you have to really, okay, well, how blue is the sky? How big are those breaks? You know, mm -hmm. how long is the grass? How much rain did you actually get? So that we can make a, a wise decision. And then we use it with fly over it if we haven't been there to make sure all right, it's looking like what they had said. The grass isn't quite as long as I thought it might be or different things like that. But sometimes you still just don't know until you're really kind of on final and 
okay, do I want to land or not? <laughs> yeah, the last second, right? <laughs> the, the the seat of your pants landing. Yeah. Now, yeah, because I thought it was interesting. I was watching uh, one of your one of your videos, um, and this has never happened. You know, I, I've I've taken off and landed on grass, but it's always you know, the, but the, the landing strips I land on in the grass, it, it almost seems like a, a golf course. I mean, it's such the the ground is really hard yeah. and the grass is really thin and you know it's 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 dry and you know I mean it's it's almost the same as landing on asphalt. Yeah. Um, but I watched one of your videos and you started giving it some power as a little bit of a run up and you started sliding right away. Like the, the ground just let go underneath you. And you're like, well, I guess I'm, I guess we're going. Um, I mean, so is it, do you usually yeah. have problems with that? Uh, you know, especially when you get into your rainy season? Um, it depends on how much rain, how much rain and how steep it is. Like I went out to a place yesterday that was an 11% slope, which is, it's a pretty decent wow, size. 11%. Slope. It's, like, it's not percentage, like slope and percentages is a bit different, but okay. they had rain all all the night before and when i landed even though it was a full-on hill it was so sloppy that when i went into reverse it just sucked mud up all over my windshield just oh. kind of plastered the whole windshield with mud um but then yeah takeoff was the kind of the same thing it was like you know once we add power we're committed it's too slippery to stop again so we're going no matter what comes in front of us we're going <laughs> yeah you're either going into the trees on the side or you're going into the trees at the end of the runway <laughs> you're not going to stop at some point yeah. so yeah, it's um. Yep. I, I you I will say uh, you know of the airline pilots do a good job of this too, and you know I think a lot of us private pilots we try to do a good job with this, but you do you do such a good job of of doing a pre flight briefing, you know of a, a pre takeoff briefing to yourself. Um, you know the first couple times I I saw you, I actually almost I actually chuckled to myself. Have you have you ever seen the the um um oh what was the name of that movie um. I want to say Tom Hanks, right? Yeah, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, um, uh, stowaway or castaway, where he talks, where he's he's castaway, the, where he gets on the island. Yeah, yeah, and he's talking to Wilson, right? So yeah. I, I, I'm like, I'm like, you know, is, is Ryan doing this for the video, or is he really lonely? And like, he has to, and he's talking out loud because I mean, you're you're doing such an incredible, you know, brief. Um, so would you do that even if the cameras weren't in the the cockpit? It's just to kind of get yourself into that I mindset. Do. Yeah, I do. Especially if there's if there's passengers on board, I'll kind of just do it in my head. Mm -hmm. But if there's not passengers, I actually will verbalize it to myself because I really feel that it solidifies it into your brain if you are verbalizing it rather than just kind of thinking about it. And then I also try to touch everything that I'm going to be doing mm -hmm. so that I'm getting my muscle memory down because in the in the case of in a real emergency, I'll probably still forget something even though I've briefed it two million times. So that's why I do it is just to really get in the habit of doing it. Like even yesterday I had to do a go around because the tailwinds were too strong mm -hmm. and I brief it right before. And then afterwards, you know, I was still shooting a video, but my brain was so over, <laughs> had too much going mm -hmm. on to where I wasn't able to even say what I was doing, but I knew what I needed to do and then went around. But that's why I continually drill it into my own head so that in the real case of an emergency, um, I can actually hopefully perform what I want to do. You know, in, in watching you do that, you know, it's, it's, it struck me that I really believe that, that that one piece, that verbalizing the checklist, the verbalizing, you know, the emergency, you know, emergency after takeoff, right? Um, you know, verbalizing when you're landing, you know, if there's a problem on landing, the go around, just verbalizing all that and just taking your time, right? Um, you can say it fairly quickly, um, it is, you know, and efficiently. Um, but taking the time to actually verbalize it, honestly, it is really what makes a difference, I think, between professional pilots and general aviation pilots. I think that we would have a lot less um, accidents in general aviation if people took the time and actually do what you do and, and verbalize um, those steps. Yeah, I really do think so. And it, I've, had a, I've listened to a lot of um, podcasts with like professional athletes and stuff and um, like in the Olympics and stuff like that where they'll kind of run through in their head exactly what they're going to do before they go do it. Like Sean White, it's a snowboarder. Mm -hmm. And he would run his whole run, you know, all the way down and visualize all of his tricks on how he would do it so that when he would do it, it'd just be playing out what he's already thought. And it's kind of the same when we're, when I'm kind of verbalizing what my plan of action is, if things, you know, don't go as planned, I've already thought about it. So it's just a matter of playing out what I've already kind of thought through my head. Because, yeah, in the case of a real emergency and I do have a rollback and power loss or something else, 
like I'm, I guarantee you, I'm, it doesn't matter how many hours you have. If, if you haven't practiced it, you haven't thought about what you're going to do. You're just going to sit there for a few seconds and go, oh, man, what am I supposed to do again? <laughs> oh, yeah, my emergency power lever. And yeah, I'd rather it, be doing that seconds before I hit the ground, you know? Yeah, yeah, so. you, you don't have, yeah, those seconds matter in those situations. So so that's good. Yeah, yeah so I hope that, uh, I hope more of my uh, GA folks that are listening to this, you know, really take time, you know, uh, before you do your takeoff roll, really run through like, okay, if I have a power outage at the end of the runway, after I take off, what am I going to do? You know, um, you know what height, you know, do I try to turn back around or not turn back around? Um, I think that'll yeah. really, and you also do a really good job. And again, this is a professional pilot thing um, where maybe other folks that are flying um, that, you know, don't do as good a job as you, you know, I would imagine your takeoff speeds are going to be roughly the same and your landing speeds are going to be roughly the same, obviously, depending on your weight a little bit. Um, where you could probably just kind of know in your head, okay, you know, I'm going to be plus, you know, plus or minus five knots. Um, but you make it a point to go, okay, I am weighing exactly this. This is my exact reference speed and I'm putting it into the, into the G1000, um, you know, and, and it's going to be there as a little bug on it. And, you know, again, that's just a different level of professionalism um, than you see, you know, from GA sometimes, but that's sweet. Yeah. And that's too. That's why we, I really like, that's why I also really like having our checklist that we have our flip checklist um somebody i did some instructing at a 141 school and i guess that was my biggest pet peeve i hated checklists because you have your paper thing and you're looking at it and looking up on downwind and you're trying to cover all your things and you know oh crap now i'm 200 feet low because i'm looking at my stupid paper thing that's why i really like our checklist that we have because as you go through it and you get busy doing something else you already have all your checks just to, your your toggle switches and go oh i left off right there Let's pick right back up there. And it's also eye level. So your eyes are out. So yeah, I, I really think that those are a huge, um, they really increase safety having something like that rather than just a piece of paper that you can easily miss items. And, you know, as you come back to them and stuff. So. Yeah. I had an incident one time in an airplane, um, that was caused because the other pilot and myself, we missed a step on the checklist. Uh, and it was totally pilot error. Um, just got distracted in between the checklist and we didn't come back to the right spot. And, um, you know, thankfully everybody's okay, you know, no big deal, but, um, you know, but it was embarrassing, you know, um, because it's like, okay, well, uh, you know, what was yeah. the cause? And the cause was we missed an item on the checklist. Yeah. There's been, um, I know personally a couple, like two, two or three, um, incidents where they ran out of fuel because they had their fuel shut off turned off for landing oh. and then they ran out of fuel <laughs> and then they landed, you know, a half a mile before the runway where yeah. they had fuel in the other tank, but that wasn't, that was on their checklist and they forgot to check it. So that's why I think it's really, really great to have something like that. Now that was actually one of the questions I had for you. So we'll, we can just go right into that. So that little box, cause I hadn't seen one of those before. Yeah. So, so um, you kind of already did a pretty good job of explaining it, but just over so the folks that are listening, um, you know, it, it's basically a small little, maybe, I don't know, inch and a half, two inches tall. And, um, I don't know, maybe a, a, a foot, foot and a half wide, give or take. And it's got a whole row of switches on it. And you have, you know, your, your, your takeoff, you know, your stuff you're doing for your pre-flight and your takeoff. And then you have, you can flip it the other way, um, when you're doing your, uh, your approach and landing. Um, is that actually attached to anything? Is there like any electronics that thing other than lights or is it just a dummy box with switches? No. It's just a dummy box with switches. It, it originally had a battery in it with a light so that if you flip it up and you didn't have all of the switches, it would have, have um, like a a yellow light come on. And then when you have all the switches down, it would turn red. But to be honest, you never saw the light. Oh. So I'm actually redesigning one right this minute and trying to get it to production so that I can sell to other general aviation people because and flight schools because I really think that it would increase safety. So... I'm hoping in January I'll actually be able to have a product that, that people can purchase. Like a Cessna 421 with, you know, retractable gear and multi-engine and whatnot. Because I, I see how much it has increased my own safety by keeping my eyes up, up and out. And also it frees up a lot of space in your head because you're not going, oh, crap, where was I on the right. checklist? And like you said, it's easy to forget something very easily on a piece of paper. Yeah. You know, it always drives me crazy. You see that, um, like, like I've got, like, I've got a Cessna, you know, checklist here. Right. So now, you know, I, I'm not gonna reach my bag to grab the, the, the you know, the uh, plastic versions, 
but you know when you're you're you're, you're taxiing and there's all this traffic I, I use sometimes i'll fly in class b or you know a lot of times class c and um so pretty busy airport sometimes and then you'll yep. see you'll see a ga you know a plane because the, the you know the other um professional pilots don't do this but you, know, you see a ga airplane going by especially the student pilots you know and um you know they've already soloed so there's nobody else in the airplane but they're not comfortable enough yet to really do everything by themselves 100 percent and so they're taxing down the runway stuff's going on and you see their head down like <laughs> like this and you're like holy cow you really yeah. hope that something doesn't come in front of them um you know or they don't veer yeah. off to the side um you know i'll tell you what you know you have my contact information so if you get something like that going let me know because i Honestly, that I have never seen that before. Um, and I absolutely love that idea. I think that's a great idea. So if I can do anything to help you, you know, get yeah. the word out on that, I will. If you want to I send will. me a- yeah. I'm hope, like I said, hopefully in January, um, I'll have a product that people can start getting. Sweet. Now, um, I mean, so now here's the thing. So you're a young guy, right? So uh, are you looking to do this I mean, forever? Are you looking to do the corporate gig at some point or- you know, you want to do a A three eighty or? <laughs> I honestly, honestly, I don't really have much of a desire to go fly airlines or corporate or anything like that. Um, my wife and I think we've got three kids. We'd like to be here at least until our youngest, which is in fourth grade, mm -hmm. graduates high school. After that, so that's like another eight or nine years or something like that. After that, man, I don't, I don't know. No, oh, to be honest, I have a whole other two lives planned out for what I would like to do, <laughs> but yeah. uh, we'll just see how that plays out when the time comes. But I'm starting helicopter training in a year from now, oh, that's and cool. then I'll be I'll fly to R66, and then I'll probably do that for a year full time, and then I'll start switching back and forth between the Kodiak and the helicopter depending on the flight schedule. Now, what makes you all right? So. Um, I was, I was actually speaking to another pilot a couple of days ago and he's also transitioning into helicopters. And so I'm going to be as mean to you as I was to him. Otherwise it wouldn't be fair. Why the heck are you going into a helicopter? What is wrong with you? <laughs> so you people are crazy to go in these helicopters. Well, so, I think the biggest because of the need, um, we, a lot of our new missionaries that are moving into these bush locations are no longer building airstrips. Hmm. So they're able to move into a new location, build a helicopter pad in a week as opposed to two years of building an airstrip and be ready to go on their ministry and, and work out there with the communities so i can in the next probably five to seven years we're really going to transition from you know like 70 percent kodiak to be more of 70 percent helicopter mm -hmm. and then using our kodiak with a lot less locations so the kodiak might really be used more for the long haul um, type stuff. setting up our loads Sorry, we exactly yeah, get a little and getting bit of a all delay. the big loads and positioning our loads so that we can shuttle them in with the helicopter. Okay, that's cool. Um, have you have you had any uh, helicopter training yet, or is this going to be new for you? No, it's going to be new. I flew a helicopter for about twenty minutes. Um, I don't know, five or six years ago, and it's kind of like standing in a basketball with one foot. Mm -hmm. It was extremely overwhelming, um, but I'm excited about it. I actually wanted to fly helicopters my whole life and I just didn't have the money to do it and really the means to figure out how to do it. So that's why I flew airplanes, but I'm excited to have something different. I enjoy what I do now, but I think it will kind of renew like the newness of flying here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The constantly challenging yourself, I think is really important for a lot of people. Um, you know, otherwise you stagnate yourself. Yeah. So now the, now the R66, yeah, think, is that a Robinson? Yeah, it's a Robinson R66. Yeah, so it's a turbine engine, and the setup that we're getting is all going to be glass cockpit so that it's going to look the same as the Kodiak as much as we can so that for us Kodiak pilots that are transitioning back, back and forth, everything looks the same. Where our eyes are always looking are always the same just to keep safety at a higher level. Mm -hmm. I just out of curiosity, so just out of curiosity, um, I mean, the, the Kodiak's not like a super fast airplane. How fast does the Kodiak go on a normal cruise for you? 160. 160, that's pretty good for something that size. Now, um, now an R66, uh, any idea what that, what the speed of that'll be cruising? I think cruise max is 130. Okay. But because we're flying around mountains and some turbulent air and whatnot, because it is a two-bladed prop, they do have, like, there's a higher risk for um, bump stopping, basically, where you're rotor will basically come back and chop your tail off. So okay. 
Um, I think we're planning on doing 100 knots or 110 knots. I, I, it's one of those. That's what we're going to do all of our flight planning around is that. Okay. But it's nice because I have started with a Kodiak. I know where the turbulent areas are. Mm -hmm. Like we don't usually just have clear turbulence very often. It's just it's usually specifically around mountains and specifically certain areas of mountains or um, I'm glad I started with the Kodiak. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the helicopter would be nice too, though, um, like you said, because, you know, if somebody didn't cut the grass down in the last week, I mean, you'll, you'll have access to a lot more. And, you know, listen, if somebody has to cut down 4,000 feet as opposed to just, a you know, a square, um, it's a lot easier to maintain. Exactly. So um, now it'll be yeah. interesting to see if they, if they shut down a lot of the existing strips or if you'll just get more locations that'll open up with the helicopter spots. Uh, the airstrips are slowly shutting down over years just because they'll have like some logging roads or something like that built to place. People are like, well, we can just, you know, take a five day trip for nothing or we can hire a plane. So let's just do the cheap option because they don't have the money a lot of times. So slowly the airstrips deteriorate or if the missionaries have moved out, you know, they don't cut the grass enough and everything. Mm -hmm. It just kind of gets overgrown and then we eventually close it for good. Now, what got you into um, starting the vlogs? You started those, I think, uh, around March, right? That's right. And sometime in March, um, I've actually wanted, I've thought about doing them for probably like two or three years. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I was like, man, no one's going to watch them. It's probably a lot of work to do it. So I just don't really know. But then um, I had another business thing kind of take a crap just because of COVID earlier this year. And so I was mm -hmm. like, well, maybe I should like look in doing this and i think it'd be something fun to do i love making videos whether it be aviation or family or motorcycle or whatever else i just like making videos so i started making them but i was kind of watching a lot of the other flight vlogs out there who fly in the states and stuff or even australia and whatnot and there's a lot of atc you know chatter and i'm like man there's like there's they'd be such a boring flight because i only talked to them like 30 seconds out of my flight i'm like what am i going to fill my flight vlogs with because it's just no one's going to just want to sit there and drone along because I've seen those two. And after about 10 seconds, you're like, oh, this is so boring. <laughs> so right. that's why I started talking just about like my procedures and what I'm doing, what I'm thinking. Because I'm like, I have to fill this 20 minute video with something. Otherwise, <laughs> no one's going to watch it. And um, I don't know. I think it resonated with people because that's an aspect that people don't normally get is kind of what the pilot's thinking right. and why they're doing it. They're just seeing them do it and going, oh, I wonder why they did that that way, you know? Yeah, you're right. So much of our time here in the States is filled with ATC. Um, you know, it actually would almost, it's almost difficult depending on, you know, if you're not in a long haul flight, you know, you know, going between areas, but because you just, you just sit there and ATC, ATC, new, new frequency, new frequency. Um, I mean, every time you try to say something or go into a big thought, you know, ATC is probably kicking in, you know, even if it's not talking to you, you know, it's talking to somebody. So exactly. Um, now, yeah. now you actually, um, uh, I think I actually caught on to you pretty early, but, uh, I will say that, you know, YouTube is a long-term game typically with most people. It, it takes years, you know, to kind of get seen and get picked up and kind of develop that community. Um, you have somehow fast tracked it. You found, you found the perfect, like you were just saying about how much you want to talk and how much you're showing. You've kind of you've kind of found that sweet spot because like in just eight eight months, give or take, uh, from the time of this recording, I think you're almost at a quarter million subscribers already, and that's um that's pretty amazing. So one congratulations because that's obviously showing that you know your editing skills. Um, you know most people don't realize when they watch YouTube, you know they just watch a video and they're like, oh this is great because they're used to watching TV and they don't realize that that, that TV yeah. show has two hundred people that are working on it that are editing and script writing and doing lighting and doing audio and, and man, you are every, like when you're doing what you're doing, you're doing it all. <laughs> there is no, there's nobody else. I mean, do you edit your own videos or does somebody else edit them? No, I edit my own videos. I've had a few people ask me if, if they wanted to do it for me, but I actually like doing it and I've got it down to a system now to where, I can pump out a video anywhere from like two hours to four hours. Mm -hmm. um, so I've come up with just a lot of systems to try to be able to get it done as fast as possible. Because the first ones were taking like 10 hours and I was like, oh, I can't do this. This is yeah. this is taking up my whole Saturday. I still want to be able to do something, you know, like watch other 
YouTube videos or yeah, right. <laughs> going to write or something. <laughs> but I think the biggest thing with the success is it's in a niche that hasn't been filled yet. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a kind of a well, I mean, PNG is the land of the unexpected and the unknown. So I think there's a lot of intrigueness about PNG and bush pilots. And so it's an aspect that people just don't have any idea of what actually goes on. So I think that's part of the biggest reason why people enjoy this stuff. Now, is there any bush, just out of curiosity, is there any bush pilots out there that are flying like the really big tires that are going into like really obscure places? No, because PNG, all the airstrips are government regulated. They they have to be a certain width, a certain length, you know, I don't know about slope and stuff, but there are specific regulations that they have to meet. So we don't have any runways that are like, I don't know, some of them are pretty bumpy and pretty small and stuff, but like our tires on our plane are 29 inches. Whereas, you know, like I think a bush plane, like a little carbon cup or something might have maybe 31 inch tires. So they're not not even really that much bigger but because it's such a smaller aircraft they look really big this looks huge yeah but um yeah so i think most our average air trip is probably about 1600 feet long yeah and like you said too you're running an aircraft that's got a four blade prop on it with a lot of horsepower um sitting back and sitting under the hood so it'll, it'll drag you off that runway pretty quick yeah now, now so you said about a thousand kilograms give or take 800 to a thousand that, that's pretty much what you're you're lifting yeah, if we take out all the seats, we can do right around a thousand. If we have all our seats on board, we can do around nine hundred, depending mm-hmm. on how long the flight is and how much fuel we have on board. Now, because you don't typically have, like, unless maybe I'm wrong, you could tell me. Like, so the mission, like, when you go onto a flight, does somebody call or is it has some way to check in with the missionaries or people at the airfield, and they can tell you, hey, listen, it's raining. It's you know, we have the fogs rolled in. There's not enough good visibility. You have that ability to kind of get the conditions in advance. Yes, at some places we do, and some places we do not. So some places, um, like down in the Sepik area, the flatlands, and they're just kind of just swampy jungles. They have to get on a boat and travel for two hours to the nearest airstrip. Oh. So by the time they get there, they don't have cell coverage, and so there's no way. So I would say the majority of the time on Almost all of our flights, we're actually using the Windy app. It's just like a worldwide weather app that I think was maybe originally created for like sailing and whatnot. But mm-hmm. that's the app that, that we use to get basically the forecast for the day to see if there's low clouds. We can look at the satellite. We can look at the the actual satellite to show how much rain is going on in, in different areas. And I've been using it now for about a year year and a half maybe a little bit more and I, I used to take screenshots of the day the forecast to see and kind of compare like okay that's what it said it was going to be like so that's kind of what i can expect in the future and and kind of interpolating what the app says and what i'm ex- expecting mm-hmm. so it that has helped a ton on planning my day so that i can get back before the weather gets bad where before it was kind of like you just go out and you deal with whatever you have to deal with and your blood pressure goes up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Am I going to be sleeping here tonight? I mean, have you, I mean, I have to imagine you've run into a couple of times where you kind of, you know, you're not, you're not getting back off or once you get on, do you kind of see the weather starting to come in and like you try to turn that airplane around pretty quick so you don't get stuck? Yes. That's usually what I do. I start yelling, everybody get in as quickly as you can. We're going now. <laughs> I don't want to sit here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Cause I can yeah. imagine. If you, Thankfully, what, I haven't had to. Yeah, because I can imagine once you get stuck, you could be there for a few days if the weather doesn't clear up on you. Very much so. That's the one nice thing about the Kodiak is that we can fly IFR here, Mm -hmm. and we have a lot of IFR routes to all of our locations, but some of them still require you to get out VFR to a specific spot, and then from there on you can go. But I know in years past when they flew the 206s that weren't IFR rated, yeah, they spent sometimes like you could get socked in for four or five days at a place before it opens back up for you to go yeah, i'm still amazed that that people will fly those 206s that are not ifr rated like that that's a big deal in alaska you see a lot of accidents in alaska from uh you know 206s and such like that where the um the airplanes aren't ifr rated and you know you can go from sunny and 80 degrees in alaska to a snowstorm, you know, and no visibility, you know, in half an hour, it seems like. And actually, you know, one of the last questions I actually had was a selfish question. 
um because you're doing something that i don't know how you're doing it and so i so um so i need you to train me how, how you're doing something so almost you know a lot of us nowadays we use four flight um and you're using four flight as well uh, i will say i'm surprised you don't have like a, 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 a um, an ipad mini or something on the window um you've got it handheld but um is there, is there a reason why you're not mounting it um i have a mount for the side window like if i were to use it for like um an ils or something like that mm -hmm. and i know that i have a flight that i'm going to use it i bring my you know my ram mount or whatever so i can mount yep. it up like that but to be honest like i just don't like having it block your i vision. feel like it's just in the way like if we had like a yoke mount or something like that or or if you had it up on the window mm -hmm. because you're I used to fly with it on the window at first, but it was it was just it was always kind of blocking something in my view. So that's why I don't like it up there. Even on my side window, mm -hmm. if I'm flying around mountains, like you're always always looking and moving all around. Oh, that's and, true too. Yeah, you know. So if you're flying ILS, you're just kind of just flying straight in, and it's okay to have it right here, which is nice because you can keep it open at all times and just have your eyes move. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we don't fly with it except for pulling it out to look at our strip charts or to look at our minimum safe altitudes. And then after that, we just kind of toss it away because we don't really use it for every every little, like in the States, there's so many options that you can use on four flight here. Mm -hmm. It's whatever content we've uploaded into it. And that's all that works. Oh, I guess I never even thought about that. Yeah, so you don't have the same, the same charting, the same weather forecasting, the same, all of that information. You guys probably aren't running ADSB either because you just don't have that, um... The radar and the communications out there we have adsb out but we don't have it in so okay. i know that the maf caravans have it in and out so they can pick us up on their screens way before we can pick them up we pick them up when they're probably within like five miles of us okay sometimes not always yeah yeah it doesn't seem like Papua new guinea's airspace probably isn't all that busy right until you get to like the um the big airports yeah, I would say at all times in the whole in the whole country there might be like twenty airplanes flying at one time. Oh and wow! It's like, okay. like the size of California, so yeah. there's really not that many airplanes. Maybe a bit more with helicopters and stuff, but it's not a busy airspace by any means. Yeah, so 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 you know, as opposed to California, there's there's airports in California that probably have twenty airplanes in the pattern at one time, let alone <laughs> the whole country. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. All right. So yeah. the question that I had, um, the selfish question I had was, I noticed on your videos that you will show four flight, you'll bring four flight up onto the screen. Um, now I don't have my, uh, my iPad on or else I would, I would punch it up on my screen too. But, um, but you are, are you recording that after the fact or so are you like, cause it looks like you're doing all the stuff and it's showing like live. So how are you recording the screen? There's um, an app called just i think it's called screen record or okay. something like that um or screen capture or something so before my flight i start i'll hit that and it will basically also i'll leave the screen on, on my whole flight so i don't turn off the ipad at any time mm -hmm. and it will basically record whatever's on my screen at all times and then before my, my videos to sync all my audios and to sync it up with that i'll just clap my hands kind of like the yep. clappers for like the old you know movies and stuff yep and then I'll sync those claps up and then that's how I get it. And I, it's kind of irritating. I, I think I've gone through three or four different apps to try to find one that works consistently all the time because they're really big files. I mean, sometimes there could be like an hour long flight right? and I want to make sure it's recording the whole thing. So I try to do it on every one of my flights, but there's been probably like probably 40% of my flights where something goes wrong with that. And then I can't add that in, but I think it gives a really good added extra mm -hmm. something to give people a better visual on exactly where I'm going and kind of where the mountains are is what they're seeing from the videos. Yeah. I think, you know, yeah, I love seeing it. Um, I hope you keep doing it because um, I love being able to see, okay, here he is because, you know, like probably a lot of people, especially, you know, other pilots, right. We, we live vicariously through everybody else. Right. So, you know, I'm not flying in Papua New Guinea, so I'll pop over uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I'll pop over and I'll go, okay, well, where, where, were you, where was he doing this flight? You know, and I'll throw it up in Microsoft Flight Simulator or X-Plane or whatever. Um, you know, and what does it look like? Now, obviously, it's never going to be as pretty as what you're seeing. But um, but, but it's really helpful because you can it's see. It's pretty real on Microsoft Flight Sim, though. Yeah, I'm not, you know, listen, between the two of us, I, me and Microsoft Flight Simulator are not friends right now. So 
they they did that update and i can't <laughs> it's just not working for me i've got to like completely uninstall it reinstall it so i'm back to x-plane for right now i hope to get back to it pretty oh, soon because it's really pretty <laughs> yeah it really is um all right let's see here i think that was pretty much it the one thing i do want to mention though is that um you have your youtube channel but you also have a patreon um and so what are some of the things that the folks can um can kind of interact with you and get with you to uh from your patreon that they can't your youtube channel uh i like to put on extra content like when I go to a bush location, I'll usually shoot like a two or five minute video, depending on how much time I have and what what I can actually talk about. Uh, to walk around the airstrip and show it, I have a drone I'll throw up to get a better picture and kind of fill in the story behind whatever flight that is. So I'll link it with whatever flight it is. Mm -hmm. um, I like doing that. Sometimes we interact with the people, um, I, like if they're lawnmower is not working, which is usually the case. Yep. Um, and uh, then I also like to be able to, like you said, um, provide a way that people can experience PNG at home. Like, again, so many people, PNG is not even really on the map for most people, and most people think it's in Af Africa because there's a <laughs> Guinea Africa. But yeah, most people true. just don't have any reference to what it looks like or what it is or what the people look like, where how they live, how their houses are, and stuff. So I like to be able to share my flights so that people can recreate those flights at home in their flight simulator. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to make it, I don't, I don't have the time to do flight simulators myself. So I don't really know exactly what they, what would make it better for them, but I try to give as much detail as I can, my altitudes, what the weather was, was like. So that, and then I also try to get my screenshot from my actual track so they can fly exactly the same track and put in the distances and, and things so they can see exactly what it is. And they wanted to fly along with my video as well. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, especially when you're showing it, um, you know, in real time, uh, you know, so they can take off with you and fly. That's 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 pretty neat. You, that, that is something that um, you know the, the current computer technology of the last ten years is allowing um, that you know you never could do that before. So that's that's pretty sweet. Um, all right. Well, I think that was yeah. pretty much all the questions I had. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead in the show notes below. I'll put in a link to all that and. Um, are you also on Twitter or anything? Is there any place people want to follow you? I do have Twitter um, and I also have Instagram. But yeah. to be honest, like I would say if people are interested, Instagram and YouTube is really where I put my time into yeah. just because I don't have the time to really invest into so many platforms. I right. wish I did, but I don't. So Instagram, I usually will just post photos from my, my day. Um, and then YouTube, I do it twice a week. I just switch my schedule from sun to Sunday and Thursdays at 11 a.m a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. So, that, yeah, and that's good, too, because like for people that don't know, like right now, it's 8 o'clock Eastern here, but for you, it's 11 a.m. tomorrow. So you're living, you are, you are technically that's living right. in the future. So, that's right. <laughs> so can you, can you please tell us what happens in the future by 15 hours? Um, so, so that's good. So we'll put that on. Um, and again, thanks, you know, uh, Ryan, I know that, um, you know, it's, it's th these are a little challenging because there is a delay. And so the folks listening to this, you're going to be hearing a little bit of a delay between uh, when Ryan is speaking, when I'm speaking, they're going to hear a little bit of pauses in between. Um, and it's just Ryan's on the other side of the earth. <laughs> so that's what we got. It's amazing that we can see somebody, uh, you know, <laughs> as good as we can from the other side of the earth uh, in, in 2020. Um, so that's pretty much all I had, Ryan. Ryan, anything else you wanted to, you wanted to bring up or, or talk about? No, thank you so much for having me on. I really do appreciate it. Okay. Thanks for reaching out. Sounds great. Well, Ryan, I, I wish you well, and I hope that everybody, um, you know, has a safe, Hey, just kind of curiosity. Um, how is COVID, uh, affecting everybody at uh, Papua New Guinea? Has it been really bad or has it not been too bad or, uh, um, it hasn't been too bad. COVID is here for sure. Um, like I know like the official numbers is showing one number and just from kind of hearsay and whatnot. There, there definitely is some COVID around here, but I think because it's not built up by the media and stuff, it, you know, people will get sick and they get sick and then they get better. But, right. um, yeah. Yeah. You don't have the clustering of see people. See what too, the actual probably. number is. No, it's, yeah, I know it is here, but it's, it's not nearly as bad as everything else. And people are so used to having, you know, TB and all these other terrible things, malaria. Right that I think 
few months ago, I don't know if it's the prime minister or something, they came on and were like, hey, guys, we've been dealing with this kind of stuff for years, you know. This yeah. is just one more thing, so we're just going to have to deal with it kind of thing. Oh, that's that's true. Yeah, you don't even think about you know you live you know in a country like the United States or in Europe or something like that. You don't even think about living in places where there's malaria and TB. You have to worry about you know. So COVID's like the worst that you know we have to deal with for a long time. And you go to some other places and it's like you know is my water safe to drink? <laughs> so it's just a different yeah. different different concept. So all right, well Ryan, again, thanks so much. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. And um, you know, are you going into the dry season or the rainy season? We're, we're now going into the rainy season, so okay, pretty much rain worse. starts almost every day around 2.30 or so. 2.30 to 3, it starts raining. Okay, all right. So you try to get all your flying done in the morning as much as possible then? and Very much so, yep. Yeah, okay. You get, you get all that time to edit all these videos in the afternoon. So so for those that wanted to watch you, you, uh, you said on, uh, would you say, Wednesdays and Saturdays? Uh, that's used to be my old time. Now it's Sundays and Thursdays. Sundays and uh, Thursdays. 11 a.m. Eastern Standard time okay so 11 a.m sundays and thursdays okay that's right. right sweet all right i'll make sure i check those out too all right ryan well happy holidays to you thanks so much for joining we'll talk to you soon likewise thank you all right so that was our conversation with ryan farron um again if you look in the show notes down below you will see a link uh to all of ryan's uh, social media um his youtube channel uh if you are anybody who's interested in aviation definitely go check him out um, one of the things he does better than almost anybody else that, that I've seen so far and probably why he's growing so fast is he is very vocal about the thought process of what he's doing. Um, a lot of times you'll see a pilot going, Hey, I'm going to Chicago and I'm going to land on runway one nine. And, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, with Ryan, you really do get the, the flow of, of what he's doing, why he's doing it. And it's a single pilot airplane. Um, so he has to do it all. Uh, there's, there's no co-pilot there to lean on. And uh, if you are looking to find out more information about what we're doing, uh, my name is Bob Roberts. I'm an aerospace education officer with Civil Air Patrol here in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. Um, if you're looking for Twitter, um, we have aerospace underscore live. Uh, YouTube is slash Robert Roberts, a name so nice. Uh, my parents used it twice. And um, <laughs> podcasting, we are aerospace dash live. So Twitter is underscore live and podcast is dash live. Uh, if you're interested in Civil Air Patrol, uh, please go visit GoCivilAirPatrol.com. And with that, I hope you all have a great day. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you did, please do me a favor. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content. Up here on the left-hand side, you're going to see another video from our uh, this playlist. And if you click down here, you're going to see another video on our channel. Hope you guys all have a great day. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.